Hello and welcome to Cross Lanes United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Krista Rexrode Wolf, and I'm joined in this time of social distancing with some other folks who are going to help me with worship. We have our director of music, Mr. Justin Velo, our accompanist, Ms. Deanne Taylor, Deanna Taylor, and our liturgist today is Dory Workman. And we're so glad that you all could join us from wherever you are. I'm imagining. Um, I'm imagining all of you in the pew here. This is stranger than I thought it would be, but we are glad that we have this way of being together. And so um, this morning, this afternoon, this evening, whenever you happen to be tuning in, we want you to be in a posture of worship with us. Thank you. Please join me in the call to worship. Remember your baptism and be thankful. We are thankful for the ministry of Jesus and who gives them the tools that they need to do likewise. We are thankful for the body of Christ. Good morning. Our first hymn for today is Great is Thy Faithfulness, and I encourage you all at home to uh, hum along with us, sing along with us, just be with us in this time of praise through music. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father, there is no shadow of turning with Thee. Thou changest not Thy compassion, they fail not. As Thou hast been, Thou forever. Great. 
great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. to cheer and to guide, strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings, O oh mine, with ten thousand beside. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. join me in the unison prayer. O oh God, thank you for thinking of us as a people worth saving. Thank you for using your power to make wholeness accessible to us. Help us be people who use our gifts for others. Help us be people who open doors, eyes, and possibilities for those who have lost hope. Amen. Today's anthem is called Able by Need to Breathe. There's a host of hurts we come across, none of which alike. From the air inside the birthing room to the darkness where we die. Though I think I'm Strong enough to carry all this load, I'm not able, I'm not able, I'm not able on my own.
I'd like to talk to the kids now in the same way that I've been talking to my kids at home. I know that um, I, I know that you're not here with me, but I wanted to, to chat with you for a moment about what's going on in the world and at church. Um, a lot of our routines have been interrupted. You might still get up and be brushing your teeth and combing your hair and changing your clothes, but a lot of other things are, we're not doing anymore. We're not going to school right now. Maybe you're staying home or with a grandparent. Um, maybe you're not doing uh, homework at night, you're doing it in the middle of the day. Some things are just not the same. Maybe you're going to the store and you're seeing folks in gloves and masks, and um, that can all feel a little um, weird, even a little scary, and it's okay to be afraid um, and to, to let your mom and dad know that you have questions about what's going on. But as Christians, one of the things we do when we see other people afraid is that we try to focus on how good God is. And one of the ways we can remember how good God is is to think of things we are thankful for and to remember that all good things come from God. And so I want you every day while you are home and not here with me to think of one thing you are thankful for and pray about that thing. And I'm gonna go first. Uh, today was not a normal day in our house, but that meant that I had time to fix a really big, really delicious breakfast. I had pancakes this morning. Normally, we don't have time to make big, fluffy pancakes in my house, but this morning we did have that time, and I was able to share those pancakes with my two kids, as you, whom you all know. And I was grateful for that time together and for the food we were sharing. I hope that every day um, you'll think of something that you are thankful for. It's good to talk to you all. Even when we can't be together, God loves you. And I trust that God is taking care of you as God is taking care of me. Let's pray together as we always do by clapping our hands together. And you all can repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for this day. Help us. Look for the good. Amen. Every week at Cross Lanes United Methodist Church, we share together, we multiply our joys, and we divide one another's burdens so that they're easier to carry. We call this the pastoral prayer. And today I'm going to lead prayer, and I'm going to leave a time of silence so that um, you who are joining us from home might put in your own prayers. Um, and I encourage you, uh, as you do that, to be praying for your global neighbors and for those who are close to home who are ill or isolated. Um, as we always do, we pray for the suffering and those in need of hope. We pray for God's compassion and mercy. Let us pray together. Faithful God of love, you blessed us with your servant son so that we might know how to serve your people with justice and mercy. We gather the needs of ourselves and others and offer them to you in faith and love seeking to be strengthened to meet them. Let us pray. O oh God, shape us and transform us by your grace, that we may grow in wisdom and in confidence never faltering until we have done all that you desire to bring your realm of shalom to fulfillment. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, amen. We also offer every week a time to receive gifts from the congregation, offerings and tithes. And even though we are not together today, we still um, seek opportunities to serve in this way. At Cross Lanes United Methodist Church, every week when we receive the offering is a time of prayer. Today, I encourage you to pray, oh God, what do you require of my 
time, my talent, and my treasure. And as you pray, um, you can think about um, giving your offering in one of two ways. You can call the church office and the secretary will help you set up electronic giving, or you can mail your check to the church's address on your screen. Let us give God thanks for this opportunity to give out of our abundance. The gospel lesson today comes from John 9, verses 1 through 17 and 28 through 20, 33. As he walked along, he saw a blind man from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, it is he. Others were saying, no, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was Sabbath day when Jesus made mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, He put mud in my eyes. Then I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, 
What do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He said, he is a prophet. Then they reviled him saying, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. The scripture for today says Jesus was walking along when he found the man born blind, but really what Jesus was doing was slinking along. He had just finished an argument, which happens a lot in the Gospel of John. The entire middle part of the Gospel is a series of stories in which Jesus performs signs and miracles, and those signs and miracles divide those who witness them. Some into believing that Jesus is the Son of Man, and some into believing that he is nothing more than a dangerous populist. In the story that happens right before Jesus meets the man born blind, Jesus is arguing with his opposition about eternal life. Jesus claimed that those who believed in him would not die, which sounded strange to many who loved the stories of their ancestors, Moses, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the people knew that their beloved faith fathers were dead. So who was Jesus to claim that people would never die? Was he greater than their fathers of faith? In this argument, Jesus has the last word. He says, I assure you before Abraham was, I am. And then he hid and he snuck out as people began to throw rocks at him. And it is with this argument still on his mind that he begins to walk around the city. Now, I can't know what Jesus was thinking, but I imagine as he came upon the one described as a man who was blind from birth, Jesus starts to think to himself, sight really belongs to those who are willing to see God at work in the world, to believe that God has not finished building the faith with the ancestors. It continues. And so when the disciples point to the beggar and ask if it was that man or his parents who had sinned him into blindness, Jesus decides to show the disciples that suffering is not always a result of sin. A fact Jesus himself will come to carry soon enough. No, Jesus wants to make the point. The real sin is being closed to the continuing work of God. The real sin is in believing you have God all figured out. The real sin is believing you know who deserves to be saved. The real sin is denying community to the people who need it most. So Jesus approaches the man, and as he does, he turns to his disciples and said, No, neither he nor his parents have sinned. This has happened so that God's mighty works might be displayed in him. And then Jesus spits in the dirt, makes mud, and cakes the man's eyes with it. And he tells him to go and wash. And as the mud drips off of his eyes, the man begins to see light. And, and this news travels fast in his small town. The people who had always known the man born blind see him wandering around the city, and they start to ask how he has gained his vision. Over and over again, the man is given an opportunity to proclaim the works of God. He tells his story first to his neighbors. The one they call Jesus made mud, smeared it on my eyes, and told me to wash. I washed, and then I could see. The answer is so confusing to the man's neighbors that they take him to the temple, hoping that their religious leaders can draw some clarification for them. So they take him to the temple, the very one Jesus had been kicked out of. And the Pharisees there, the religious authorities, ask the man the same question. 
And again, he tells them his story. The man they called Jesus put mud on my eyes, I washed, and now I see. To those who have chosen not to recognize who Jesus is, this is an offense. Now not only has Jesus claimed to be greater than Abraham, he has also worked on the Sabbath. The neighbors and the temple leaders are confronted with good news, but many of them choose to only see the answers, only to interpret the man's experience in a way that fortifies what they think they already know about God. In verse 16, some of them say, this man isn't from God, he breaks Sabbath law. It seems that so desperate are they to be right, they become blind to the miracle in their midst. So desperate are they to protect the stories they think they know, they are willing to ignore the obvious revelation that has taken place. So desperate are they to cling to their own power, they will do anything to make sure the powerless stay that way. They don't want to see the man born blind with sight, because if he can see, and if Jesus is the reason he can see, everything they know is undone. They are afraid of what they cannot control. They are afraid of uncharted waters. They are afraid of letting go of one way of life, and so they do not see the new way of doing life that Jesus brings. Between verses 1 and 41, the man born blind bears witness to God's work through Jesus seven times, proclaiming over and over and over again the truth he has experienced, and eventually that truth gets him expelled from the temple altogether. Not one person along the way was willing to believe with him that God was doing a new thing. Not his neighbors, not his parents, not his religious role models, but this man was convicted by his experience and he allowed nothing, no one, to diminish the good news he had to share. As the recipient of a miracle, this man is special, but his real gift is not the gift of physical sight. The real gift Jesus draws forward in this man is his capacity to witness to God's good work. And he does so in powerful, persistent, confident ways. He is a vessel of a very important message. He, his very being, is a testimony that everyone is worth saving, everyone is worth bringing up from a place of disadvantage. The community isn't whole without every one. He is a vessel of an important message. We can't expect to know how God will work for the good of those who love him. God is often doing a new thing if we have eyes to see it. God is adding to the community if we have mouths that bear the good news. This man's story confronts me with a choice, just as it did those who witnessed it in person. I can choose to see the world as a series of events that fortify what I think I already know about God, about scripture, and about the community, or with humility, I can view the world as a place where God is still at work in ways I didn't anticipate, and I can bear witness to the hope God brings in powerful, persistent, and confident ways. I know it is difficult to know how to be a follower of Jesus in these days. We aren't in our place of worship. Speaking to you this way is strange to me. Every idea I've had in the last week about how we can edify each other during the COVID-19 crisis required some form of gathering. I couldn't even think outside of us being close together what we know is being undone. 
We cannot control what is happening. These are uncharted waters. This is a new way of being community. But we do not have to be afraid. Jesus has reached out to each of us and has given us a chance to see, to bear witness to God's work in the world. What do you see today? How is God still at work? Has God gifted you with something in these difficult days that will help you be well? Has God increased the community in some way we didn't anticipate? It's true, we are not gathered in one place, but we are still one body, an active faith community. While we practice social distancing, we also practice social accompaniment. This is not the world Christians are used to. Our mission has so often been to tend to the sick and be attentive to the most vulnerable. Our mission has often been identified with bodily closeness. And so all of this can seem really hard. But today we can walk alongside each other in new ways. We are called to bear witness to good news. We must choose to remember how Christ comes among us and we must hold on to our hope. There are people who want more than anything to see only what is going wrong. This is brokenness, and to them, we have an opportunity to be something else, to show that God does not leave his people abandoned. I've been saying in my communication with the church all week, faith is not canceled. And because we want to be a people of faith, a people who can see God at work in the world, we have some suggestions for ways to strengthen your vision at home. I'm going to ask my screen folks to help me here. The first way you can practice your faith in the time of COVID-19 is to remember your Lenten disciplines. I think it is especially important now when we are not reading together to read through the Gospels of Matthew and John. Those are the Gospels we will be following this Christian year. I also encourage you to pray for the day we can gather again safely. In addition to praying for our time together, I want you to pray concretely, specifically, for five people by name, in addition to your prayers for your global neighbors. Write two notes a week to the most vulnerable folks in our midst whose isolation may be more pronounced. I suggest starting with our church's kids and our homebound members. They may need more than ever a word of encouragement. If you don't have a church directory, please contact the church office for more information. If you are looking for ways to be in worship at home, um, I encourage you to invest in a home study. And if you have children, a good, a good children's Bible. I'm going to be listing those recommendations on the website under our COVID response tab. And lastly, if you miss your small group, a book club, a Bible study, whatever it may be, contact me or the church office to learn how we can connect your small group together through Zoom and Google Hangout. The curriculum might not be the same, but the company will be. Sisters and brothers, this is not the time to look for what is going wrong. It is a time to hold on hope to believe that God has given us a testimony and to bear witness to a good and generous God who even now is pulling forward a gift for us. We give God thanks for this day and for all the days to come. Amen. For our invitational hymn today, we are going to be singing, His Name is Wonderful. And during the invitational hymn, when we are joined together, Krista invi Pastor Krista invites us all to uh, take a trip to the altar rail if necessary and gain support. And I encourage you, 
during this time to reflect on your needs and, and spend the time in prayer as you join and sing with us today's invitational hymn, His Name is Wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful, Jesus my Lord. He is the mighty King, Master of everything. His name is wonderful, Jesus my Lord. He's the great shepherd, Rock of all ages, Almighty God is He. Bow down before Him, love and adore Him. His name is wonderful, Jesus my Lord. Sisters and brothers, we've heard the good news of the gospel. Jesus Christ has given us sight. Today, choose to see God still at work in the world. Hold on to hope. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. 